but it's 20 minutes with discussion. Okay, so good morning, everybody, on a beautiful day in Corfu. And we are ready to start the last day of the workshop on this beautiful Sunday with a talk by Samuel Kovacic on microscopic black holes. Please, the floor is yours and the screen is yours. So thank you for introducing me. And I would like to start with expressing general happiness about again being at live conference this is a little side project for me uh, because usually i'm working with things we have been discussing last week like fuzzy spaces theories uh, expressed using matrix models and so on but at some point i asked myself the following question whether things we are doing actually have some real world consequences because usually if we ask ourselves if the theories we discuss have some measurable predictions, the story is, yes, they have meaningless effects unless you shift to the Planck scale of energy. However, there is a lesson from history that is from Robert Brown that actually you don't have to see atoms to notice their existence. You just have to see something in between uh, the scale of atoms and the scale you live in. And you can see that there is some effect on something that you can actually, actually observe. So the question for me is whether Planck scale physics have some effects that we can actually observe. So something in between. And as I was pondering this question, I stumbled across the article by Piero Nicolini and his colleagues, that was about something called non commutativity inspired black holes. What does it mean non commutative geometry inspired by black hole? It basically means they just took a non commutative space and realized that in this space you cannot have a perfect delta function. You can approach to it, but you cannot have something that would be completely singular. So they used coherent states to derive something that resembles a delta function, but isn't a perfect delta function. Then they took this solution and uh, plugged it into Einstein, Einstein field equations to get a solution. And they searched for a solution in the Schwarzschild form, which is basically the first is minus one over the second one. So it's basically something that looks like a Schwarzschild black hole, but instead of having perfect singularity, it has something that is called blurred singularity. So in this, in their case, it was basically like Gaussian blurred singularity. The solution to these equations with this right hand side is basically this function. So it looks like the Schwarzschild solution minus one plus two m over r plus some correction, and this is in uh, units when Planck length is equal to one. So after a couple of Planck lengths from the singularity is basically the same as Schwarzschild solution. This is how it looks like. So basically the red line is the Schwarzschild solution, minus one plus two M over R. And as you move very close to the singularity, their solution basically went down to minus one. So far away from the singularity, the solution is basically the same. And then you can see some difference. Important thing about black holes is the position of their horizon, 
which is basically the point when they cross the horizontal axis. In the usual case, there is only one horizon, which is here located at R equals six Planck units. In their case, there is one horizon here and second horizon here. So in general, the solutions look like this. They start at minus one, go up, turn and go to minus one again. When the mass is very large, there is one horizon far away from the origin, close to the Schwarzschild value. And then there is a second one close to the origin. And as you decrease the mass, the two horizons are moving toward each other and they merge at some critical value of mass. Now, what happens to the Hawking temperature? The Hawking temperature is close to the ordinary value when the mass is very large and it goes up. And at some point it actually reaches a maximum value and then very sharply drops to zero. And you can actually understand why this is happening. Uh, the, short, the Hawking temperature is proportional to the gradient at the horizon. And at this critical mass, the gradient is zero at the horizon. So the temperature had to go to zero. So this was done, I don't know, 15 years ago, more or less. Now, because of this, somebody realized the following thing. First is that the black holes, instead of evaporating completely, they become frozen at mass that is proportional to the Planck's mass, which was basically this point. So when the mass is on the order of Planck's mass, the temperature goes to zero and you're left with something that is called Planck's remnant. Now their cross-section is on the order of Planck's area, which is 10 to the minus 70 meters squared. So they basically they are impossible to interact with. There is no chance that you can just throw something into such a microscopic black hole. So because of this in 2004, uh, Chen et al concluded that such frozen microscopic black holes are perfect dark matter candidates. However, this suggest suggestion wasn't widely uh, recognized in the astrophysical community. And still in this community, they just claim that small black holes just completely evaporate away. So there is that some tension between those two communities. So this is when I got involved in the theories of microscopic black holes. Uh, it's basically Planck's length size and Planck's mass and Planck's area. So it's, everything is Planck's uh, scale. So the solution I showed you before was basically with singularity of the form e to the minus r over lambda. Lambda is the Planck scale squared. And this is the solution by Nicolini uh, and his collaborators from 2005. There was an older paper by Irena Dimikova from 92 which had alpha equals three, so basically even sharper decay. And the solution they got from what they called non creative inspired black holes was from two-dimensional space. So they took two-dimensional space, look at the overlap of coherent states and got the solution. What I did is that basically I derived the same thing, but directly in three-dimensional space. So the solution I got had alpha equal one, and in each of those cases, you get a black hole that is of the order of Planck's mass, Planck to the duh, but the results are slightly different. And first thing I got interested in a year ago is whether those results are actually general. And I found out that after some rescaling, they basically collapse onto each other. So if you rescale the temperature with respect to the maximal temperature and mass with respect to the minimal mass, the solutions are basically the same. So what I tried then is basically trying different uh, singular matter distribution. So maybe something like the exponential decay or rational functions. And in all of those cases, basically the temperatures, temperature profiles are the same. So the temperature is first increasing and then very sharply drops to zero. So the first important finding is that those results seems to be very general. So you don't have to rely on a specific form of the, of the blurred distribution, 
to reproduce those results. So this should somehow strengthen the claim that those are good dark matter candidates because it's very insensitive to the details of the theory. However, another thing I realized a year ago is this there should be something like a recall effect because from this point of the microscopic black hole having maximum temperature, it evaporates down to the frozen situation by radiating something between 10 and 100 quanta of radiation. And this is true for all of the models. Each time the black hole radiates a particle in one way, it gets recalled in the other way, which usually doesn't matter because the radiation is very soft and the black holes are very large and massive. And in this case, the black holes got very small and the radiation is very energetic. So it receives, for example, 10 kicks in random directions. And as a result, they don't cancel out exactly because there is a very small number of them. And the frozen remnant obtains a very large recoil velocity. Thank you. And the recoil velocity is basically proportional to the difference of radiated mass between the maximal temperature and the frozen temperature and uh, mass of the remnant divided by one over square root of n when n is the number of radiated quanta. So basically the microscopic black hole is doing like a random walk, but not in a configuration space, but in a momentum space. And after doing uh, n random steps, it's recalled away from the stationary position. And then here I computed the recall velocity for all of the considered cases. And in each of them, it's on of the order of 10% of the speed of light. So that means that actually microscopic black holes are not good dark matter candidates because they are very hot. And we know that the, cold, that the dark matter is cold, which means it's moving only very slowly. So it's incompatible with the current description of microscopic black holes. So I wrote a short paper about this, put it on archive, and very shortly, shortly after that, uh, Lehman and Profumo wrote a short article that, okay, this is true unless the small black holes are formed very shortly after the Big Bang, and then expansion out of space slowed them down again. And then they computed some kind of restriction that what, what is the final moment of their production for them to be compatible with the cold dark matter models. Which then I again took and tried to push it one step forward. There is a classical result from Carr, which tells us something about the formation of the primordial black holes during the earliest stages of the universe. And he, uh, he calculated that the typical mass of a black hole that is formed from, uh, from inflation or over densities that are collapsing during the radiation dominated era is governed by this relation. So it's proportional to the time and it goes like 10 to the 38 grams over a second. So we can ask the following question, like if the primordial black holes had to finish the evaporation process before this time, at what time must have they been created? And it's a matter of simple calculation to show that actually they had to be formed around 10 to the minus 28 seconds. So which is basically very, very shortly after the end of the inflation era. So the summary is that the first part is that Planck scale physics can make difference in our low energy world. So it's not like we are studying Planck scale physics just for the sake of future particle colliders or that are large as our solar system to see the Planck energy effects. Actually, we need to understand Planck scale physics to understand astrophysics and the world around us. And that's the important take home message. And now the new findings is that basically the results about microscopic black holes are very robust. So we don't have to rely on the details. The second important effect is there is a very strong recall effect that is enhanced by the quantum structure of space. So small microscopic black holes are actually very fast, which seems to make them incompatible with the current 
dark matter model unless they were formed very, very shortly after the end of inflation era. And of course, all of those studies were just approximate. We would need uh, the full theory of quantum gravity to understand all of the details of the evaporation to be able to estimate some gray body factors and so on. But from the robustness of the results, I would claim that there is some merit to those results and we should take them seriously. So this is everything I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Samuel. Now there's time for questions. So questions, comments, please, George. Just for information, uh, who has uh, considered the uh, uh, fuzzy uh, black holes? Uh, the, the literature, could you give us some information on the literature? So, those three guys from Italy were probably the first to consider, uh, it's uh, Piero Nicolini. Okay. But, it wasn't proper a proper fuzzy black hole. It was just fuzzy inspired black hole. Then uh, Brian Dolan from from Dublin. He was basically modeling. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, Dimnikova. And she wasn't doing fuzzy black holes. She was doing uh, the effect of quantum polarizations on the on the singularity. So it wasn't it wasn't fuzzy, but the results are very similar to fuzzy results. Uh, Pablo. So um, yes, I would like to know better because this uh, work by Nicolini, Spallucci, uh, it was just an assumption that uh, there was a minimal length of this uh, black hole uh, that uh, so is there some uh, dynamical mechanism or even uh, let's just physical argument more than, well, let's assume that there is, a, instead of having a delta function, mm -hmm. there is a spread of the density mass of the object. So, there are two lines of physical reasoning. One is like just hand waving that we know that uh, there shouldn't be a point like point like structure in a UV complete theory. So there should be something preventing a complete collapse. And it seems that no matter how you prevent the collapse, the result will be the same. But there is another line of reasoning. Basically, we saw some lectures about M theory trying to describe what is happening inside of black holes using models of interacting D0 brains. And this is something I would like to investigate in more detail. Like if you get, if you can get some kind of singularity description from the M theory, and then again, compare it with those assumptions that were made. Yes, also a toy model I think would be interesting to show some um dynamical mechanism or, or more, um, uh, well, a, a mechanism where this, uh, no, this space distance, this uh, minimal length emerges. It's yes. not just taken as a... Yes, and I, did, I think this is a possible way of doing it, like taking those M theoretical description of black holes and using them to get the description of the singularity. Yes, I think that would be very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Any more questions? There are no questions online. I have last one, very short questions. I mean, in this theory, I mean, you can also have uh, the black holes which would be of some type with, so for instance, charge. Mm -hmm. I mean, would they be detectable? I mean, of course they would be detectable and they would be different from particles. So would it be, what would be the explanation that we don't see them? Uh, 
I'm not sure. Like there are some studies that describe something called black atoms, which is basically a very a microscopic black holes with charge that basically attracts some particle that is around them. And I don't know, it's like there is the problem we don't understand what is happening during the radiation. And the claim is that it should probably radiate all charges and just be left as a simple as possible black hole. But my current point of view is, I don't want to say that microscopic black holes don't exist. I cannot just conclude it at the moment, but they are being pushed away in the parameter space. Okay. At least because before doing those studies, basically there was a huge time period for their creation. I think now it's shrank to very, very tiny period. So I wouldn't bet my dog on dark matter being composed of microscopic black holes right now. Okay. Thank you very much. If there are no more questions from the audience here and the audience online, then let us thank you once again. Thank you. And we can smoothly move to another speaker who is remote. Okay, Carmelo, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, we but, need to uh, wait yeah. for your screen. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. That's a the problem. I suppose I have to share the screen. Yes, you need to share this. Yeah, you're sharing the screen, but you need to share your presentation. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, sorry, I'm not used to Zoom. I use Google Meet. Open the slides. You have the slides open. Yeah, I've got the slide open. And uh, my screen is sharing. We, you know, we could slide. So, so your screen is shared. So you, what you need to do, you need to probably minimize the zoom and maximize the your presentation. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, no, no. Mi minimize the. Yeah, but I don't know how to do that. Let me see. Minimize it. Yeah, yeah, this one. Uh, now there's. Okay. You don't see my screen. So we see your screen, but we see this zoom. This, this, uh, this is uh, whatever I mean, the Chrome or, or the browser. So you need to minimize it. No, just minimize this, this thing. Maybe you explain better. No. No. Uh, you need to uh, reshare your screen, but should be your slides. You shared the wrong window. So can you reshare okay. the proper screen? So I have to go back to the to where now. This is there. There is okay. Uh, wait, I, I'll actually assist you. Hold on. No, no, you cannot call him out. No, it says there. I'm sharing the screen, and uh, I'm seeing my 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 slides, but you don't see them. Well, now we see your slides, so we can start with the. You see my slides. You see my cover slides. Uh, welcome to the second talk by Carmelo Perez Martin on unimodular supergravity. Uh, 
we're a bit late uh, with the beginning, but nevertheless, please, the screen is yours. I let you, I warn you after 20 minutes, because the talk is 25 minutes plus five minutes discussion. So I will warn you after okay. 20, 20 minutes. Okay. 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 Let me, uh, okay. Thank you very much. Before I start, let me congratulate the organizers for putting together such a tremendous array of uh, speakers from all over the world. And uh, besides, I would like to thank them for giving me the opportunity of presenting this, this work here, in this uh, meeting to pay homage to John Mador. Uh, today, I, I'm going to tell you about unimodular gravity, uh, a piece of research I've I've done with uh, with uh, Anero and Santos Garcia. All the details that I will escape during this talk can be found in these two papers here. And uh, the plan of the talk will be the following. First, I'll start by uh, reminding you what the modular gravity is all about, because perhaps not uh, not all of you are are familiar with unimodular gravity. Then I will jump and to construct or formulate the, the linearized version of uh, unimodular supergravity. And then I will consider the, the full interacting unimodular supergravity theory. Now, what's unimodular gravity? Unimodular gravity is a theory with, with this action here. Okay, this is the, the standard action in general relativity, but the difference is that the determinant of the metric is constant, is set equal to minus one. So the determinant is not a dynamical uh, variable unlike in, in the standard general relativity. Then addition of this type, and this is of course the cosmological constant term, are physically irrelevant. Now, uh, classically the equation of motion of the modular gravity are the so-called trace-free equation or Einstein's traceless equation. Actually, they were uh, put forward by Einstein before the, the standard general relativity equations. And uh, those equations are obtained by considering variations of the action under variations of the, of the metric, which are constrained by this, by this condition. Then uh, from, the, from this stressless equation, using the second by, sorry, the second, uh, Bianchi identity, you end up with this uh, the covariant derivative of this combination of the scalar curvature and the trace of the energy momentum tensor actually vanishes when you take the covariant derivative. And therefore, this is a constant. This is a constant of uh, an iteration constant. And if you put this result back, back, back into the, uh, the initial equation which you obtain, it's actually the standard equation of general relativity with uh, a cosmological constant. Those are Einstein's equations with a cosmological constant, but the, the metric is restricted by the unimodular condition. In this regard, uh, classically, general relativity is the equivalent to uh, unimodular gravity. Now, uh, they are not equivalent as quantum field theory because at least when the cosmological constant is not zero. Uh, whether it is, believe, it is believed on that there is no general proof of that, that if we set the cosmological constant to zero, then uh, general relativity is completely equivalent to, gen to unimodular gravity as quantum field theories. Now, uh, why study unimodular gravity at the quantum level? Now, my motivations are the, are the following. Uh, the first one, this is the, the main one, because it solves in a Wilson way the huge discrepancy that exists between the quantum field theory prediction for the vacuum energy and the experimentally observed cosmological constant. Uh, in, in, as a quantum field theory, in unimodular gravity, the vacuum energy does not gravitate, does not, it's not seen by gravity. Uh, more arguments in favor of this, of this idea why considering unimodular gravity can be found in, in these two, in these three references. And uh, I would like to point out in, in a paragraph in, in reference to what it says, uh, what about experiment? 
the experimental prediction for the two theories, I'm just reading the paragraph. General relativity and modular gravity are the same, so no experiments can tell the difference between them, except for one fundamental feature. In general relativity, uh, the cosmological constant, the prediction for the vacuum energy, uh, give the wrong result by many orders of magnitude. Whereas unimodular gravity does not suffer this problem. However, in Stephen Weiber review of modern physics on the cosmological constant, uh, it said that in my view, the key question in deciding whether one should use unimodular gravity or general relativity is whether the theory of unimodular gravity can be obtained as the classical limit of, of any physically satisfactory quantum theory of gravitation. Uh, I have two further motivations. One is that when one uh, looks at ordinary differential geometry from the one from the point of view of uh, non-commutative geometry, uh, there is some kind of quantization of the volume form. Uh, I'm not going. I'm not going to be. In, I'm not going to be involved in that discussion. But you may check uh, the review by Gracia Bondia. And actually, uh, unimodular gravity somehow uh, arises naturally when formulating uh, gravity on non-commutative uh, modular space-time by using the Sabre-Witten map, some time of Sabre-Witten map. Now, uh, actually, let me see why unimodular gravity, uh, when it is considered as a quantum theory, is a theory of gravitons. Uh, now we know that if if gravitons exist, they would be they, they will be um, massless particles with helicity too. Uh, however, you know the metric in general relativity has got ten degrees of mathematical degrees of freedom, and you have to go down from ten mathematical degrees of freedom to two physical degrees of freedom. Uh, to do that, one uses the invariance and the full deformed morphism group. Now, in general, in unimodular gravity, we don't have the full deformed morphism group, but just the transverse deformed morphism group. That's, it, that, that's the set of transformation of general of, of coordinate transformation, which preserve uh, the determinant of the metric. They are defined here. Okay, so we have to make sure that we have enough redundancies to go from, from uh, four degrees, from nine degrees of mathematical degrees of freedom to two physical degrees of freedom. And that can be achieved by just using uh, the transverse diffeomorphism group. Now the, here, the, this is the, the, the counting of degrees of freedom. So we've got nine polarizations. We also have this traceless condition. So we have nine and you have to uh, to remove nine degrees of freedom owing to the transversality condition of the polarization vectors, and three uh, due to the fact that we are considering this uh, transverse diffeomorphism. So at the end of the day, we got two helicity states. Actually, uh, those these fellows here showed for the first time that when you consider uh, the unimodular gravity uh, propagator in Minkowski space time. And uh, you couple those that propagator to uh, external sources, you get the same amplitude as in the same process in general relativity. Okay. Uh, actually, it's why I saw by Alvarez, Blas, Garriga, and Berdagé that if one asks what's the most general quadratic action of this type, which is invariant on the transverse diffeomorphism, you only get two possibilities, either the first Pauli action, that is to say, the linearization of, of a standard general relativity of the action of linear unimodular gravity. This generalizes to, to curve space-time. And you may find the details in the, in, sorry in the paper by Barceló, Carvalho, Rubio, and Garay. Now, why 
consider uh, why two supersymmetries supersymmetrized unimodular gravity. Those are my motivations. First of all, because supersymmetric theories tend to be more tractable than standard theories, and they got beautiful properties. Of course, they get an improved ultraviolet behavior. And uh, let's recall the what Stephen Weinberg wrote in in his review that we need to to check whether unimodular gravity can be obtained from some physically satisfactory quantum theory of gravitation. And uh, we know that superstring theory and uh, of course N equal eight supergravity, they are both supersymmetric theory. So to start this supersymmetrization of unimodular gravity, I will start with the linearized version of unimodular gravity and see whether everything works, because if this does not work, that is to say, if I cannot add a, a massless helicity three halves uh, particle and find some uh, supersymmetry transformation, then the, of course there is no, no sense in trying to get an interaction theory. Uh, so the actual, the action of unimodular gravity is this one here. It's just the standard action of uh, general relativity, but you, of the linearized version of general relativity, but you impose the constraint that the trace of the, of the graviton field is equal to zero. Now, this action is invariant under, under transverse infinitesimal linearized diffeomorphisms. And uh, in order to get a supersymmetric theory, so this is the free part of the of the of the interacting sugar theory. Now, uh, in order to get a supersymmetric theory, I have to add a, a massless helicity if you have a Majoriana field. So I have to figure out a, an action for that uh, for that field. And uh, the obvious starting choice is the Rorita single action. Uh, we know that this action is in, has got a, a gauge invariance, which is this one, where this chi here is an arbitrary Majorana spinner. So, uh, so the starting point of the of the linearized would be perhaps so an equal one supergravity theory would be the the sum of the those two actions, the linearized unigravity and the uh, Rorita super action. Now I have to to find out the uh, transformation that turn the graviton field into this new Majorana field and vice versa. Uh, okay. Uh, the obvious choice would be this one, which is the, uh, more or less the standard uh, linear supergravity uh, transformation, but with this constraint here. Now, uh, this epsilon here is an infinitesimal rigid Mariana spin -off. Now, they stand those transformations would not do because, of course, they, they do not preserve the traceless constraint of the, of the graviton field. The variation of the, the, those transformations of the, of the trace of the, of the graviton field is equal to this, and this is not in general equal to zero, and, that, and therefore to make the transformation compatible with the, with the unimodularity, unimodularity condition, I have to impose this extra condition of the graviton, oh, oh, sorry, on the gravitino field, let's call this uh, high gravitino field. This is surprisingly what is called the Rarita Schwinger gauge. And we have to consider field configuration in unimodular gravity, which uh, for the gravitino field, which satisfy this constraint all the time. Okay, uh, one might have thought that, well, perhaps one can take advantage of the fact that the transformation for the, for the gravity on field are defined modulo transverse diffeomorphism. And so one can take advantage of this transverse diffeomorphism to 
preserve the, the faceless condition under, uh, under those transformation. Well, this is not possible because this field, the, 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 femorph the femorphism has to be transverse. And therefore, in order to, to set to zero the variation of the traceless uh, of, of, the, of the of the trace of the of the graviton field, we need this condition to hold that is incompatible with the transversality of the of the sphere here. So we have really to impose another constraint on the on the set of fields. So okay, uh, but this is not all because because now we are considering this. Sorry. This uh, uh, unimodularity, unimodularity constraint from the from this uh, gravitino field, we have to make sure that again the transformation here we introduce at the beginning preserve this constraint, and they don't because that variation gives this result, and this is not equal to zero. But now we can take advantage that the uh, transformation of the gravitino field uh, is defined modulo against transformation, which is this one. And then perhaps I can choose this guy here, the finite degree transformation appropriately, so that the unimodularity, con unimodularity condition for the gravitino field is preserved. And okay, now I want to formulate the theory of shell. So I'll come back that later about this. What I, do I need to, cho to choose if it exists to preserve the unimodularity condition for the, for the gravitino field? I'll have to introduce to make the, the to define the theory of shell, which is convenient, uh, three uh, further fields, one real scalar, one we have to the scalar and one pseudo vector. And I consider this action, which is, there's no dynamics in this action, of course. And the, the final action of the linear action in modular gravity will be this one there, the sum of the, of the three of them. Now I will propose the linearized and equal to one super transformation and check that they do define uh, Supersymmetry transformations. Now, uh, okay. Now there is this bit here, which is uh, which is a gauge transformation, the gauge transformation piece of the of the supersymmetry transformation of the gravitino field, and uh, in order that this gauge transform, in order that this supersymmetry transformation preserves the, uni, the unimodularity condition for the, for the gravitino field, that is to say that the gravitino field stays all the time in the rate single gauge. I have to choose this theta here, be given by a solution of this equation here. And the solution can be obtained by using the, the green function method. Okay, uh, one can show all the details are in the paper that the action is invariant under those transformations. And uh, but this is not enough, of course. I have to check that the commutator of those of, the, of those two uh, supersymmetry transformation uh, uh, closes on translation modulo gauge transformations. And okay, one can check after some a little algebra that the result is this. So this, that, 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 and that are of course translation of the corresponding fields. Here I got what is, is a, a linear diffeomorphism. Uh, and here I got a gauge of formation. But uh, I, I have to check. Sorry. For me. Okay, all right. So you can check everything and uh, that it is transverse, and actually that this transformation satisfies the 
uh, Dirac equation. So the uh, transversality, this is a valid gauge transformation because it's, it's, it preserves the unimodular condition. Now, uh, uh, I will jump to the, to the full interactive theory. And to do that, I shall follow the usual route one introduces the, the fear bind and uh, the spin connection uh, with the, the appropriate contortion so that the spin connection has got a torsion. Okay, and this is just the Levy connection, the Levy Chivita connection, the, the, the torsionless connection. Okay, and I also need for the standard a curvature for the speed connection and the derivative of the gravity of field. So uh, now I have to impose, of course, to, to make the theory unimodular, I have to consider the field bind to satisfy the, this uh, determinant one condition. And by consistency with the linear theory, I have, I have to impose as well the, that the, this Rarita finger gauge. Now, uh, I have to introduce the action. The action will be introduced just yes, by covariantizing the Leonidas action. And we have to remember this result obtained by Buchmüller and Dragon that all the set, the set of tensors for unimodular transformations constructed from the metric and its derivatives is the same as the set of tensor of general coordinate transformation. So, uh, okay, the, the guess for covariantizing the linearized theory is just you replace the linearized gravity with the standard Einstein, the Hilbert Einstein actions in terms of the fear bind, but with the condition that the fear bind has got determinant one. And you replace the standard derivative with the covariant derivative. There is no change, of course, in the in the auxiliary field action. So this is the action, and this is the standard uh, gravity and equal one gravity action. But the only difference is that the fields here satisfies the unimodularity constraints. Uh, now those are we introduced tentatively this. Uh, uh, those transformations, and one can check that those transformations actually leave the, the action invariant, but we have to make sure that those transformations um, preserve the unimodularity constraints. That is to say, the determinant of E is equal to one and the, and the rarita swing gauge. And those transformations, of course, do not preserve uh, the, uni the unimodularity constraints because this, the parameter defining the, this, transformation, the, this transformation is not constrained, so it's not surprising. So, uh, so we have to impose some constraint of this epsilon so that both unimodular constraints are satisfied and that constraint is the following one, sorry is this here. So the parameter defining, let's call them those sugar transformation, unimodular sugar transformation has to be a solution to this equation here. Okay, so because I'm running out of time, I will skip this and that. And uh, now with, you, you can check, or can check after some horrible algebra that actually the uh, unimodular gravity action it invariant under those transformations, and that the commutator of those of two of those transformations closes um, transverse diffeomorphism, Lorentz transformation, and a sugra transformation with neo parameters. Now this is not trivial because one has to check that this parameter is transverse, and that satisfies the constraint. I have introduced here. And there is no, at least I, I could not find any reason why that should be so. But, uh, you see, uh, in the, now look, this uh, parameter, this vector field defining the, the diffeomorphism uh, depends on, on these two objects, which are position dependent, of course. And it's not trivial that those satisfy that equation because those epsilon have 
those two epsilons have to satisfy the, the constraint I introduced at the beginning, but they do. And actually this uh, sigma defining the Sura transformation is given by, has to satisfy that equation. And it's given in terms of uh, epsilon one and two by this expression here. And because of this addition, they do satisfy the, the constraint equation for the, uh, for the super transformation. So it is really a unimodular super transformation. So uh, everything is okay. So I've defined a unimodular version of the n equal one, sorry, n equal ones, yes, and d equal four supergravity theory. And uh, now what about the classical solutions? Now the, the classical solutions are obtained by setting the gravitino fields and all other fields, but the, but the metric equal to zero. And the, the equation I obtained, the classical equation is this one, this is the, well, the, the uh, equation of unimodular gravity in four dimensions. And we already know that that equation has got uh, three solutions, which are the Sita, Antilla Sita, and Minkowski. Uh, but only Minkowski is invariant on the unimodular square transformation. The reason is that uh, because of setting all over fields, but the gate, but the graviton field equal to, to zero, then the, the solution will be invariant on the, on the those transformation I, I introduced if this equation here is, uh, is satisfied. Now we know from that result by Paul that uh, the, the existence of, uh, of uh, Killing Spinner, this is the equation, the Killing Spinner equation, automatically demands that the scalar curvature be zero. So uh, the sitter and the sitter break supersymmetry spontaneously. Now you may think, well, but yes, but this epsilon here might be not, perhaps is not allowed in the unimodular case because we, this epsilon should be constrained by that equation. The point is, if this is a clean spinner, then uh, the constraint equation is automatically yeah. something. Okay. So, okay, so I'll stop here. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry, you know, we have to keep to the very tight schedule. Thank you very much. Time for short questions. Here in the audience, George. Hi, it's George here. How are you? Uh, fine, thank you. And you? Yeah, fine. Uh, I wonder: is this uh, the first time that uh, unimodular uh, supergravity has been considered, just from uh, information point of view? And the second is: uh, 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 what about the quantum level uh, of unimodular versus uh, ordinary gravity without supergravity? Let's say you mentioned something. I understood that the only difference is uh, that uh, unimodular uh, leads to Minkowski, right? Uh, basically. Sorry, Spade. that unimodular? No, I mean, what I mean, I mean if, 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 uh, if uh, you said the, cos the cosmological constant equal to zero, yeah. uh, then it is believed, although there is no proof, general proof of that, that the, um, that the scattering matrix for unimodular gravity and the general relativity are the same. Mm -hmm. I've done some checks of that, of the three level and coupling matter and see how they will, how the theory behaves in the ultraviolet, surprisingly uh, behaving the same way, although the quantization process is completely different. I, I, mean, I mean, the general strategies via ST, of course, but uh, the, the physical, the, the non-physical degrees of freedom are completely different. So it is a, quite a surprise that they agree when the cosmological constant is equal to zero. When the cosmological constant is not equal to zero, then they are different, okay? Because there are corrections, ultraviolet uh, divergent correction to the cosmological constant in, the, when in general relativity, and there are none because the cosmological constant 
uh, does not gravitate in the unimodular gravity case. And uh, I have forgotten your, your first question, sorry. Well, the, um, the first is the last, if it is the first time that uh, somebody like you has considered the unimodular for gravity. Uh, sorry, time... I, I, I do not hear you well. Uh... Is the first time that uh, somebody is considering unimodular supergravity like the first time? Uh, so. um, well, there is another, up to the best of my knowledge, yes, this is the first time. Although there is another paper by, by, uh, by someone from, from the UK. Uh, but the philosophy is different because they they use the they use some some trick to to recover full diffeomorphism invariant, and we don't want to keep uh, we, we just want to keep uh, transverse diffeomorphism invariants because this makes the difference between at least from the point of the conceptual point of view from unimodular gravity and general relativity. Okay, thank you. Thank you very You're much. Yeah. I think you know there are no more questions. I see no more questions on that. So thank you very much once again. Okay. And we slowly move to the next speaker. So we need Kaya, Frank Ferrari. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Just let's wait a little bit till. Uh, the screen will be shared. So, is it you or uh, Carmelo? I think you need to stop sharing. Sorry, the screen. sorry. sorry. Uh, okay. Okay, and then uh, you could, uh, oh yeah, you already started sharing the screen, so we can start with the next talk by Frank Ferrari from Université Libre de Bruxelles. Welcome on this sunny day in Corfu. And well, on Jackie Teitelbaum, Teitelbaum, I think you need to pronounce it correctly, quantum gravity is finite cutoff. Please, the screen is yours. I will give you a warning after 20 minutes uh, before, before, so that you have five minutes and then five minutes for discussions, please. Okay. So thank you very much for the invitation. I'm desperate not to be with you in Corfu, but uh, these are difficult times. So let me start with a very brief review of two-dimensional quantum gravity, which is an old and very venerable subject, just to put in perspective, uh, uh, new aspects that come when you uh, uh, talk about uh, Jackie Teitelboim, which is the, um, the main subject of my talk. So, uh, of course, uh, you have the Liouville quantum gravity uh, uh, with the action that you can see on your screen. Uh, uh, this is the continuum version of standard two dimensional quantum gravity. You have matrix models. Uh, that uh, uh, can also be used to approach the problem uh, via some statistical physics formulation, if you like, and double scaling limits, string equations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And also in this subject, you have a, a version which is called topological and which is related to the intersection theory on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces, a la Konsevich, Witten, etc. Let me emphasize that very recently, uh, uh, rigorous formulation, rigorous in terms of, uh, 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 from the point of view of mathematician, have been developed for these theories. And I refer to the work of Duplantier and Sheffield, but also Roth, Vargas, and other mathematicians. So it's very interesting to see that it took about four decades to go from the Polyakov, let's say, first insights into this problem to a fully rigorous formulation in probability theory. Now, you uh, have to know that you really have two classes of standard 
quantum gravity in two dimension. As I said, you have the general case, the, no, the standard case, which, which is Liouville, where the integration over metrics amounts to integrating uh, essentially over a, 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 scalar, a scalar field, which is the Liouville field. And on top of that, you have an integration over some moduli space that I call here MGB. You also have another version called topological. So it's more mathematical, maybe more easy, uh, but it's not really easy uh, anyway, but, but it's easier, it's less physical. And in this formulation, the metrics that you consider are constant curvature metrics. So typically you impose R equal minus two. This is related to the theory of flat PSL to R connections. Uh, the path integral over such metrics is a finite dimensional integral with a measure which is the famous weil peterson measure. And this has been studied uh, a lot in the mathematical literature. Konsevich, Witten, Mirza Khani uh, more recently made a spectacular progress in understanding what's happening here. Now, Jackie Teitelboim is somewhat in between those two cases. It is similar to the topological case because we uh, uh, impose the constant curvature metric constraint. So the metrics that we consider are all R equal minus two in the most maybe interesting or physical case, but you could also consider R equal zero or R equal two. So negative zero or positive curvatures are the three possibilities but we will emphasize more the negative curvature case. So you impose that. So it, it looks like a very strong constraint. On the other hand, some boundary conditions that you have in the topological version are waived. So typically in the topological version, the boundaries of your space time must be geodesics. And that's a very strong constraint. In Jackie Teitelbaum, you waive that constraint. And that makes the world difference. Some degrees of freedom will be now associated with some fluctuating boundary. And as a consequence, the resulting model has an infinite dimensional space of metrics over which one must integrate. So it's, it's much less trivial, let's say, than the finite dimensional topological case. And even on the disk, you get a non-trivial metric. Here, I just made a small picture a typical picture of the geometries that are involved with uh, some tubes that show you where the boundaries are and, and these boundaries fluctuate. It's they're called wiggling boundaries, if you like. So here, just to recall the action for Jackie Teitelboim, this, uh, uh, you have this uh, scalar field phi, sometimes called the dilaton field, which plays the role of a Lagrange multiplier that imposes the, the constant negative curvature constraint. And the JT partition function is obtained by integrating over matrix and phi and is in general a function of a couple of parameters, which are the length of the boundaries and the value of the Lagrange multiplier that you fix on the boundaries. So you, when you look at, into the action, you see that phi is, the action is essentially proportional to phi. So it's not surprising that the classical limit in these models is obtained when, when the boundary value of the Lagrange multiplier field goes to infinity at L fixed. So that yields the standard, let's say, perturbation theory uh, in, in those models. Another interesting limit is, is called the infinite cutoff limit. It amounts to take phi to infinity together with L to infinity. So you, you the, the phi, so it's like, edge bar goes to zero, but at the same time, the length of the boundaries of your space times go to infinity in such a way that the ratio L over phi that I call beta is fixed. Uh, this limit is called near, nearly hyperbolic or nearly anti the sitter. You uh, make the link with a, a holography with a very uh, high cutoff, if you like, or infinite cutoff uh, in this limit. And the path integral reduces to an integration over some symplectic quotient d of S1 over PSL 2R. So that's a symplectic manifold. And the action of the model reduces to the famous Schwarzschild action that I've just wrote here. 
So this is a well-known story. It's uh, one loop exact. Uh, the results are not consistent with ordinary quantum mechanics. In particular, the, the, the amplitudes do not factorize when you have multiple boundaries, etc. That's a very interesting story, but I'm not going to emphasize this more here. That's not the subject of my talk. The subject of my talk is to describe an ongoing research that I'm developing here in Brussels, uh, myself in collaboration with two postdocs, Romain Pascali and Nicolas Delporte, whose goal is to develop a first principle rigorous formulation, if you like, of JT at finite cutoff. By rigorous here, I mean, I would like to have a formulation that reach the same level of understanding of what we have with Liouville. So to have both a, a well-defined continuous formulation and a discretized formulation and understand the continuum limits, the critical exponents, etc. The present literature has only scratched the surface of this problem. Essentially, you have only three papers that have started to study this problem only in the literature. All the literature has been focusing on the Schwarzschild limit, the near uh, antidecidual limit, not on the genuine finite cutoff, finite L theory. All right, so let me describe a few aspects. One first aspect, which is important, is to develop a gauge theoretic formulation of the model. We know from the topological story that you have this gauge theoretic PSL2R version of the theory, and we would like to understand how this could work here in the case of JT. So the basic ingredients are still there. You have a, a first order formulation of the, of the theory. I wrote here the gauge field A, you develop it. Uh, in terms of omega, which is a spin connection, and the EA, which are just an orthonormal frame in two dimensions, and you develop it in some PS in the PSL2R Lie algebra. And when you do that, you realize after computing the curvature that the, the, the Ricci equal minus two constraint is equivalent to F equals zero, which means flat PSL2R connection. So this is well known and, and uh, the ingredients are still valid and present here. However, uh, moreover, if you like the, uh, um, you can impose the constraint that you deal only with flat connections with the, 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 some BF action where B is like phi in the JT gravity just plays the role of a Lagrange multiple. However, the new aspect here, which is quite subtle, is that the precise gauge symmetries in the PSL2R formulation are subtle. They cannot be the naive or the standard uh, thing that applies when you have the topological formulation. And it is not very difficult to understand what's happening. On the gravity side, you have, of course, the diffeomorphisms of the space-time sigma you're considering, and you have a, a local U1 corresponding, corresponding to the local U1 frame rotation. On the gauge theory side, you also have diff of sigma because the formulation is diffeomorphism invariant, and you have the gauge group PSL2R. However, the difficulty is that if you have a flat connection and a simply connected space, you can always completely gauge it away. So if you're naive and you say, well, my JT model, for example, on a disk is just the theory of flat PSL2R connection, you fail because you don't find any degrees of freedom when you have this point of view. You can just gauge it away. It's a flat connection on a disk. You can gauge it away. There is no uh, uh, degree of freedom. So that means that the precise gauge theoretic formulation must be more subtle than what, than what one might think. And you have somehow to break the full PSL2R gauge symmetry to make contact with the gravitational model. So how do you do that? Well, some ways are well known, and, and here it's reviewed in the middle of the transparency. Unfortunately, I cannot point 
to my transparencies. So that's a bit unfortunate. Uh, but anyway, I hope you can follow what I'm saying anyway. So uh, the non recipe, if you like, to generate boundary degrees of freedom is to break the PSL2 R gauge symmetry to a subset of gauge transformations that go to the identity on the boundary. So this has been discussed a lot in the literature. The resulting model is a model for a particle that live on the group manifold PSL2R. This has nothing to do with Jacquif title one. So this non recipe also doesn't work to describe the gravitational theory. So some authors in the literature, in particular, Iezu Pufu and Verli Van Wong in, in uh, 2019, but also other authors, have tried to go around this problem by adding by hand some degrees of freedom, like loop defects in the gauge theoretic formulation. This works very well when you take the Schwarzian limit. By adding by hand these loop defects, you reproduce the, 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 the dynamics you're looking for in the Schwarzian limit, but it fails in the finite cutoff model, in the genuine model at finite L. That, that is not corresponding to the gravitational formulation. So in a paper last year, November last year, uh, it's you know, 2011, 02108, that's what I did. I developed a consistent and rigorous formulation of the gauge theory that matches exactly, that is exactly equivalent to the gravitational model. Uh, the result is that you essentially find four uh, type of consistent boundary conditions. And one of these four type is the JT gravitational model. One is the usual topological model. And you have two others, which can be understood as, if you like, the Jean transform of the other two. So they're not genuinely new. So you recover what was already known, topological. You find the JT gravity. You also find a generalization of topological, which is discussed in the paper, but I won't have time to discuss that today. Let me just mention the, the, the main idea. The main idea is that you have to break PSL2R, as I said, but not by considering only the PSL2R gauge transformations that go to the identity on the boundary. You want more, you allow for gauge for PSL2R gauge transformations in the bulk that go to local U1 gauge transformation on the boundary. This local U1, which is a subgroup of PSL2R, correspond to local frame rotations, and you're allowed to do these local frame rotations on the boundary. But you're not allowed to do the full PSL2R gauge transformations on the boundary. So with this reduced symmetry, you can add more boundary terms and by classifying all the possible boundary terms consistent with this principle, with this symmetry principle, you find what I've just announced uh, a few seconds ago, these four possible models, and you find in particular what you like. Okay, so this is just you know, the four cases, but I would just flash a so case one is topological or generalized topological. It's generalized topological because the boundaries are not necessarily geodesics, but can be uh, curves of fixed extrinsic curvature. So geodesics is extrinsic curvature equals zero. Actually, you have models where you can have arbitrary extrinsic curvatures and you have three qualitatively different cases when K is less than one in absolute value, greater than one or less than minus one. So this is discussed in detail in the paper for those who are interested. Case two is JT gravity, case three and four are Lejeune transforms, if you like, of the previous cases. Fine. So this is all I wanted to say about the gauge theoretic formulation. Now, second part, second very important problem to go further in a, 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 a detailed understanding of, of, of the theory we are dealing with. What is the space of metrics exactly over which we integrate? So the basic idea here, well known, is that constant negative curvature metrics on the disk can be obtained by drawing a deformed disk in hyperbolic space. And here I have a typical example 
of a geometry that will contribute in the infinite cutoff or Schwarzschild limit. And this is actually the type of geometries that people have been uh, considering in the literature. So you have a wiggling boundary, which is very near the boundary of hyperbolic space. Okay, so, so my disk, my white disk is hyperbolic space. On my shaded disk is actually the disk manifold, the space time on which you want to formulate the theory. And it's almost hyperbolic, almost anti decider if you like. And this wiggling can be parameterized by a diffeomorphism and you get the usual stuff. Fine. That's in the infinite cutoff, or at least that's what people believe is are the relevant configurations in the infinite cutoff limit. What about the finite cutoff? So can we really define this model rigorously at finite cutoff? And as I said, you have essentially three papers that uh, try to address this problem in the literature. Let me briefly review the point of view that people uh, have been taking. The point of view number one was uh, Kitayev and Su in 2018. They said, okay, well, we would like to define the model in terms of the dynamics of the boundary, but how, do you, how are we going to do this? Well, what we know very well is to do statistics of Brownian motion, Brownian path. And so they assume that the boundary of your disk is a Brownian path and they reformulate all the dynamics in terms of a path integral of a Brownian path. So that's just the standard Wiener path integral and you're back with some completely rigorous mathematical formalism. Uh, and that's what they develop in their paper. However, Brown, closed Brownian path are essentially very complicated, arbitrary self-intercepting path. And such path, I, I made some example, I drawn some example here, are uh, uh, do not bound a disk. In general, if you draw an arbitrary curve that self intersect in very complicated ways and it closes, it does not bound a disk. You cannot define what is the interior and the exterior and say the interior is a disk. That means that to an arbitrary curve, associated the metric on the disk. Yes, sorry? Uh, you have five minutes. Yes. Okay. So that's not a genuine quantum mechanical model. Uh, sorry, that's quantum mechanical, but that's not quantum gravity. Uh, it's not a sum over matrix. Point of view number two was Stanford-Yang, where they said, okay, let's consider itself self-voiding loops. So the boundaries is a curve that never self-intersect. That's very interesting. It goes beyond the reparameterization and that's, I have an example here of, of a geometry that, that these authors take into account. It makes the link with uh, 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 the theory of self-avoiding works, which uh, has been studied in relation also with SLE, schramm lohner stochastic evolution, etc. So that's a very interesting story. Potentially, um, uh, it of course a, a curve that does not self intersect always bound the disk, so it is associated with a metric. So that's fine. However, it misses a lot of geometry, and so that's what I want to emphasize here. This model is not either a quantum gravity theory. It it, it amounts to summing over only a small subset of geometry. The most general geometries are much more complicated. They are associated with immersed disk. And here I've just made an example. The, 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 the idea is that you take a disk, you can deform it in arbitrary ways, but when you deform, it can overlap itself in many ways. And here you have a simple example. In particular, the boundary curve can self-intersect as this example show. This yields many complications and subtleties, which are at the heart, I think, of what JT quantum gravity really is. First of all, configurations of this type can have finite action, even in the infinite cutoff limit. So that raises a question about why they've been discarded in the infinite cutoff limit. Maybe they're just 
uh, their role maybe is just to renormalize the coupling constants. I don't know. People have not discussed that. At finite cutoff, anyway, they will be dominant. And then you would like to ask, OK, uh, what are the boundary curves then? They are not Brownian paths. They are not self-avoiding walks. What are they? To determine exactly what they are is a highly non-trivial combinatorial problem. And here, this is the heart of the combinatorics associated with JT gravity. The question is, what are the curves that bound the disk? And amazing, remarkably, this problem uh, was studied in the late 60s and also in the 70s by mathematicians. But in the late 60s, the, the main basic ideas were understood and they are summarized in the Bourbaki seminar that I mentioned here. One of the amazing facts is that a given closed curve can bound several distinct disks. So I let you think about the example I've drawn here or look into the references, but that's sort of a mind twister. And it's very surprising. It means, in particular, that defining JT gravity as a path integral over the boundary curves is failing. It has to fail because a given curve might be associated with several distinct geometries. Let me finish just by announcing some of the results, and this is work of prog in progress. First results we have is that the space of metrics over which we have to integrate can is always this cushion diff of S1 divided by PSL2R. This manifold was found in the Schwarzen limit. Now I claim that even at finite cutoff, this is still the manifold that capture all the metrics, except that of course the diffeomorphism that enters here is not the same as the one that enters in the reparametrization ansatz. Of course, in the two, two of the three examples that I have drawn again here are not reparametrization ansatz. They are not, so you, you cannot associate to them a diffeomorphism in the usual way, but there's a way to do it anyway related to a formalism where the boundary UV field plays a central role. So that's a very interesting lesson. Of course, in the Schwarzen limit, they match, but only in the Schwarzen limit. Uh, when you're not in the Schwarzen limit, it's a different diffeomorphism, but it's there and allows to parameterize rigorously the space of metrics. So that's interesting. Second point is that you have a discretized statistical physics model that you can formulate also very rigorously. Essentially, these geometries, you can build them by putting squares in, a, you know, you, you, you discretize the geometry with the squares and you put the squares as I, I, I have started to, to do here in, this, in the picture. And, and the more you add squares, the more you build your deformed disk, if you like. And uh, I, I, I've emphasized the fact that in the construction, when you, you build the geometry by adding the discretized squares, you can of course go around and eventually overlap with the squares that you have already drawn. Uh, that's the square in uh, uh, pink, if you like, that uh, you have here in the picture. Just to emphasize that in general, you get something very complicated corresponding to a general immersion, not only an embedding. So the question now is, or the questions are, how many such configurations do you have with n squares and fixed length boundary? Can you define a continuum limit uh, from that? What are the fractal, what is the fractal dimension of the boundary? What, what are the scaling dimensions that allow you to, to take the continuum limit? How does the area scale with the boundary one? This is a very interesting new statistical combinatorics problem that sits somehow in between Brownian path and self-avoiding walk, because you have less boundaries than Brownian, but more than self-avoiding. So, you know, you expect that the uh, uh, scaling dimension will be somehow in between. So that's a very interesting thing to consider. The good news is that there is a matrix model formulation of this type of combinatorial problem that you can develop by generalizing 
the so-called dually weighted graph model that Kazakov, Taudacher, and Winter were studying in the late 90s. The bad news is that the very elaborated methods and technique based on the character expansions that this author had been developing at the time are not enough for the present problem. Essentially, they compute many things, but what is needed to solve the, our problem of GT gravity is just one of the things they do not compute. So uh, the technology needs to be developed, let's say, one step further. However, they've done impressive work in the 90s, and I think this problem will be tractable. So it's a very exciting to address the problem from that point of view, too. So there is uh, the hope that some deep matrix model technology will allow you to solve the combinatorial problem. Thank you very much. For Great. Your Thank you very much, Frank. And we have time for one third question here from the audience, please. Understand? I you repeat um, uh, um, the page uh, in which uh, uh, there are uh, uh, um, uh, Bronian Park and Seth have a dim work. Yes. Is it here? Uh, 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 Frank, uh, uh, je suis là, mais je peux pas parler. <laughs> so, here you have the, um, uh, an example of a Bronian path, which is essentially an arbitrary curve, if you like, on the boundary uh, that would represent the boundary of a disk. But I said that's not correct. Because if an arbitrary closed curve that self intersect in very complicated ways is not bounding a disk. Mm -hmm. So if you consider arbitrary Brownian path and you formulate the model like this, you will capture actually all the metrics, but also many more things that are not metrics. In this sense, that's not quantum gravity, right? And quantum gravity, you want to sum over matrix. The other approach is to use only self-avoiding works. Then in this case, you're safe because a, a non-intersecting closed curve does bound a disk and so is associated with a metric on the disk. That's good. However, now you're missing geometries because some geometries are actually associated with self-intersecting boundaries. And this is the example that, that you have now in front of you. So the genuine quantum gravity model is this new combinatorial problem uh, 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 where you have to deal, if you like, with uh, boundaries that bound disk and, and uh, well, non-trivial. Is that clarifying maybe what you wanted to hear? Uh, yes, it answers uh, my question. Uh, you are after somebody uh, that sits in the middle of Brownian motion and says forward in work. Exactly. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, Oh, this is yeah. very nice, actually. Uh, I wonder uh, more generally uh, how far you are uh, from uh, a realistic case of four dimensions. I mean, can you foresee uh, uh, this boundary uh, mm -hmm. point of view can be applied in four dimensions? Is it infinitely difficult to consider the realistic case of four dimensions? I suppose nobody is happy eventually to consider two dimensions, right? So, you know, let, let me uh, answer in, in this way. I, I think that these models, very surprisingly, are capturing some very non-trivial features of holography in higher dimensions. So this is now clear, and the reason for this is that you have black holes in these models. And the black holes 
have some of the features that are puzzling in higher dimensions. So all, if you like, the puzzles associated with the horizon, Hawking radiation, etc., are present here. That's very interesting. On the other hand, some other crucial um, features are completely missing. Uh, since the curvature in these models are fixed, you can never have curvature singularities in particular. So the black holes, they have horizon, they have Hawking radiation, you can ask questions about information loss, but you cannot ask questions about the resolution of the singularity inside the black hole. So in particular, I think if you want to use black hole physics to understand cosmology, because the singularity is, uh, is uh, some uh, cos cosmological sort of singularity, you don't have that here, okay? So in this sense, it's not realistic, but it is uh, much richer and interesting than what I would have thought three or four years ago, <laughs> if you want to put it this way. Uh, my interest is, is, is so manifold because of this. There's this interest in understanding black holes in higher dimensions. And also maybe what I emphasized more today was the, the fact that these models actually are new combinatorial, if you like, versions of 2D quantum gravity that are different from what people had been studying in the past and which are also very interesting. And that's also another, I think, interesting theoretical open problem that might be related to interesting problems in statistical physics. So that's also another motivation. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the answer to the question. Thank you for the discussion. Now we move to our next speaker. So you need to, I'll ask you to unshare your screen. All right, and Vladimir is here. And thank you very much. Thank you, Vladimir. You need to unmute yourself and start sharing your screen. Yes, I, I, I let me. Okay, you're okay, This is the file, yes, yes, okay. Do you see the file? Yes, we see the file. Okay, so let us start with the last remote talk before the coffee break. Vladimir Dobrev. Uh, hello, Vladimir. Good morning to you from Corfu. Hi, Thank you very much. Subgroups in invariant differential operators. Please, the screen is yours. I'll give you the warning after 20 minutes. Thank you. Okay, you see my title. Uh, the, also, the abstract was already on the web page, so I, I go on. Uh, I go on. This is the plan of the talk, some small introduction, the preliminary, preliminaries. Then our subject of study is the algebra, so star eight. And then there are two uh, separate chapters, which I will just describe in more detail when we come up to them. So, You, I do not have to convince you that uh, invariant differential operators play a very important role in the description of physical symmetries. So, and we started a systematic construction of this, yeah, and it is uh, uh, actually, you cannot do it uh, on the whole. Uh, you have the, the general conditions and the general building blocks, but for each algebra, you have to, to do it uh, on, on its own. Now, <clears throat> I focus on this algebra so star eight, and it is a part of a family which form a class of real algebras which have maximal Heisenberg parabolics of algebras. The letter are given uh, like this, and uh, where this factor M, which is determining actually what's going on, has uh, this uh, form. Uh, now there are low rank uh, uh, algebras of this kind, but they are actually isomorphic to other, other cases. So the, indeed the first non-trivial case of this class is SO star eight. This is some literature. Uh, okay, so we start with a semi-simple uh, non-compact group 
and a maximal compact sum group. Then we have Ivasawa decomposition, uh, where A0 is a billion simply connected, N0 is nilpotent, uh, preserved by the action of A0. Next, we, we have to have the M0, which is the centralizer of A0 in K. So M0 is part of K. And then the subgroup is M0, A0, N0, is called min minimal parabolic subgroup. And then in general, a parabolic subgroup is any subgroup of G which contains a minimal parabolic subgroup. And the importance of parabolic uh, group, subgroups comes from the fact that the representations induced from them generate all admissible irreducible representations of G, a general fact uh, below the references. Now, we should take mu to be a non-unitary character of A, A is a billion, and mu fixes an irreducible representation uh, d mu on a vector space uh, v mu. It's not unitary, but that's not essential. Now we have the induced representations which are induced by mu nu, and the third factor n is uh, uh, trivially represented. Uh, that's part of the general construction. So the space of function is such that it has such properties uh, on G with values of V mu, and it has this uh, property. Uh, and from this property, it is clear that in fact, uh, in fact, this uh, function um, on n tilde because the factor M A N uh, are uh, factored out. And then the representation is the left regular action. Now uh, we need to restrict to maximal parabolic. This they are distinguished by the fact that in their case, the factor M has dimension one, rank one. See, this is the general M A N and here A is one dimensional. And then, of course, uh, there is a, uh, an important ingredient that we use the highest lowest weight representations of the complexification of the Lie algebra of uh, the group G. So this can be realized as factor models of Verma models of GC. Uh, and then the weight, uh, the weight over this is determined uniquely from uh, the representation chi. Now, since uh, our representations are induced from finite dimensional representations of M, the VER models are always reducible. And then we use generalized Verma models such that the role of the highest lowest weight vector is taken by the space V mu V zero. And then for the generalized Verma models, the reducibility is controlled only by the value of the conformal weight D. And from here falls an important fact that for the intertwining differential operators, only the reducibility with respect to non-compact roots is essential. Our uh, one main ingredient of our approach is as follows. We group the reducible elementary representation with the same, same Casimirs in sets called uh, multiplets. The multiplet correspond to fix values of the Casimirs. Uh, now, people who, I have to put a remark here, people who work more with compact groups think that Casimirs fix the representation. In the non-compact case, this is not so. So uh, <clears throat> there may be many uh, representations with the same Casimir. And what we do, we depict them as a connected graph and the vertices corresponding to the reducible years and the lines before uh, the vertices correspond to intertwining operators. And the explicit parameterization, of course, is important for understanding the situation. So the multiples contain explicitly all the data necessary to construct the intertwining differential operator. Actually, the data for each intertwining differential operator consists of the pair 
beta m, where beta is a non-compact positive root of Vc, m is a positive integer. And then in this case, uh, so that the, the Bernstein Gelfand Gelfand Verma modular stability condition is fulfilled. This is a numerical condition, it's very powerful. Now, uh, when this condition holds, the model is reducible, and then uh, it can it contains as a submodule a verma module with a shifted weight, which is exactly described by this by this data. And this embedding is realized by a singular vector determined by this polynomial. Uh, and then this polynomial can be given a very explicit expression, very explicit expression. Uh, there are formulas for these uh, polynomials. And then the differential operator will be exactly this polynomial, which enters the singular vector, uh, where we substitute the, uh, the root vectors uh, by, uh, by the right action. Remember that the representation action is from the left, and this action here is from the right. Okay, so this is the these are the prelim preliminaries, and now uh, we we go more concretely to SO star eight. In fact, first for SO star two n, let me remind you, this subalgebra of SO two n with this. Uh, uh, such a condition. And in fact, it can be given explicitly by such matrices where each uh, A and B are from G and C and they have this, uh, this property. This is the dimension of G, the rank is equal to N. We have the Cartan evolution, which defines the, the maximal compact subalgebra. And then since the maximal compact subalgebra is UN, so it is, has the same rank as G. Accordingly, this algebra has discrete series representation. And furthermore, it has highest lowest weight representations, uh, which actually we love to use in, in physics because the UN contains a, a UN a billion uh, factor. There is a, there is a complementary space so that k plus p is equal to g. We need the root system, which is very simple in this case. Uh, we have such roots and such roots, uh, and then the simple roots are, are like this. We have the k compact roots. These are the roots which form by restriction the root system are the semi-simple part of, of Kc, while the root beta are K non-compact. The split rank of G is equal to N over two. Remember, this is the uh, this is the dimension of the abelian factor a, a, a zero. And because of this uh, formula, the minimal parabolics depend whether N is even or odd, and they are the same. Sorry, here is some, this uh, error plus one. The maximal parabolic subalgebras have n factors as follows. And the case j equal one is, is special because in this case, uh, the maximal parabolic is from Heisenberg type and it, it looks like this. Uh, and of course it has the rank n minus one. Now we stick to, uh, to, to, G, to the algebra G, S of star eight, which is also S of six two. Uh, and then we use the, then the Heisenberg maximal parabolic is, is like this. And from this follows that the M compact roots are J1, J3, J4. Actually, in the case of S of eight, you know, the root system is like the sign of Mercedes auto. And the root which is missing here, gamma two is in the middle. And these are, these three have uh, zero, uh, uh, zero scalar products with, with, between themselves. So this is the outlay of the Mercedes sign. Okay, now uh, the, 
we present the uh, M non compact roots. Uh, we, and now the character, to characterize the Verma modules with the Dinkin label. So these are with the, this, with the simple roots. The rank is four, so we have a M positive uh, M uh, integers. And where they are positive integers, then uh, chi lambda characterizes finite dimensional representation of G and of its real forms. Now, the, the three numbers which are to, uh, belong to the M compact roots characterize the finite dimensional representations of the M sub, M sub algebra. We have also for the M non compact roots, important are also the uh, Harry Chandler parameters, uh, which we give here. Now, the main multiplets, of course, are in one one to correspond to the finite dimensional ereps of S of star eight. So they are labeled by these four positive Dinkin labels. We take a, a chi zero to be the, the Harris Chandra label. It is also given here. It has one embedded Verma model. The weight is given like this. And then the whole multiplet. Uh, is uh, parameterized like this. I will show a picture, so you don't need to remember this. Uh, the picture follows in the next. Uh, before that, I changed the, the labeling. So these are the, the compact, M compact uh, numbers. And there is a number C, which is equal to the, uh, to this, uh, this is the Harris Chandler parameter of the highest root. And when we parameterize like this, then they start, then the labeling signature is uh, simplified. It is uh, now has this plus minus uh, stuff here. So it is even more. Uh, and furthermore, this plus minus has also the point that uh, these uh, representations within the plus minus uh, the doublets are related by intertwining integral operators in, by Knapstein. And the action on the, on the signature is such that C goes to minus C. It, in general, it can also mix these numbers, but not in this case. And now the, the multiples are given explicitly in, the, in this figure. And the pairs are drawn to be symmetric with respect to the dashed line which represents the vial symmetry realized by the Knapstein operators. So here comes the picture. This is the lambda zero with which started. This is the first embedded. And then they are uh, given like this. These are the main multiplets. The main multiplets. So each, uh, each uh, arrow here is a differential operator and then the integral are given uh, by this uh, symmetry. Now there is, there is one interesting thing. If you take, for instance, lambda, lambda k minus lambda k plus, they are of course related by the Knapstein in both directions. But one of the Knapsteins, which goes from here, from mi minus two plus, it's an integral operator, but this has degenerated to a differential one. So in this case, the integral is only in the opposite direction. And this happens for these four cases, which are, uh, which are given here. Vladimir, this is just warning. You have five more minutes. Okay, I will try to finish. So uh, the matters are the arranged so that in every multiplet, only the elementary representation with signature x, x minus zero contains a finite dimensional non-unitary sub-representation. This is annihilated by the operator Knapstein G plus and is the image of G minus. The, sub, uh, the subspace epsilon is annihilated also by the first differential intertwining differential operator. And when all M zero, M I is equal to one, this dimension is one. And this also the trivial one dimensional representation with conformal weight zero. In the conjugate representation, there is a unitary discrete series representation with, with this uh, conformal weight. 
is annihilated by Knapstein Geminus and the image of the operator uh, G plus. Uh, of course, this since we have holomorphic discrete series, then the, this representation D actually splits into holomorphic and anti-holomorphic representation, and they are actually equivalent to the uh, highest uh, to the holomorphic discrete series and the other to the anti-holomorphic discrete uh, discrete series. Uh, okay, this I already uh, said. And now what is important is that the above is applicable also to the algebra S of PQ with P plus Q equal to eight. There are three cases actually, because uh, uh, P and Q are restricted like this. Okay, so now the intertwining differential operators happen not only in this main multiplets, but in the reduced multiplets. There are four uh, main reduced multiplets which are going into the, to the vial chambers, in which MK, one of the MKs is equal to, to zero. Now the first case is M1. It contains 15 uh, representations like this. Now, some of these representations do not have finite dimensional, uh, finite dimensional inducing representation, but some have those with the red uh, this case is when uh, you can see this means that these numbers are positive integers and some of them are not. So this is important because here we also have inter intertwining differential representations of physical, uh, physical meaning. Uh, so we call them relevant. <coughs> the, other, the other important case is M2. M2, it's also, here also we have put in the red circles the relevant representations which can find a dimensional inducing representations. Now, uh, I can skip M3 and M4 because they are similar to, to case M1. And then uh, just as time is still allowing, I will show some more reductions. Okay, here are some comments about the uh, about this uh, the conformal weights and so on, but you will see them when the paper appears on the archive. Uh, now the next the next uh, reduced multiplets uh, are those. Actually, here only this one is physically uh, relevant, and M13. Here we have more physically relevant, so we have four representations with physically relevant representation and relevant intertwining differential operators. Uh, the other cases are uh, MO, are either similar to, to those, M14 is like M13, uh, M23 is, is like M12, and so on and so on. Finally, there is the last, uh, uh, the last uh, relevant, uh, last relevant case. Uh, here we have, uh, here we have this case. Where we have only two relevant representation. This is the differential, which is the generated Knapstein. Uh, here, what is important is that. All the all the thirteen uh, roots uh, roots containing root alpha two are entering. It's a very very interesting uh, interesting picture. So I can uh, the other cases are less interesting. They contain only three representations and no physical element. I show them nevertheless. And uh, that's uh, all uh, I, I have to, uh, okay. That's all I have to, to say. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Vladimir. So time for questions, comments, remarks, please. First from the audience in Corfu. George. 
Hi, Vlado. Here is George. Oh, hi, George. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry that I was not uh, able to come, but we, that's life. We miss you. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, your research, of course, is uh, far away from my uh, knowledge. But yeah, let, I, I'm with you, yes. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, let, let me ask you a, a student question somehow. Uh, is the usual problem when we go, let's say, from uh, compact uh, groups to non-compact, like uh, SO4 to SO3, uh, comma 1, when we go from Euclidean to uh, Mikovsky and Signature and so on? Uh, is there any way to select in the non-compact case uh, uh, finite uh, representations? I mean, from your talk, I understood that this can be done in uh, what you have examined, but is there a way to restrict uh, somehow the full spectrum of uh, representations of the non-compact to, to, to select finite ones? The, the finite dimensional are selected very simple because they are, uh, the, they are the same as the compact, only they are non-unitary. Uh, that is the other. Yes, of course, for the non-compact, the more important is the, inf the infinite dimensional representation. The compact are in the, this picture, which I showed, maybe I can come back again here, sorry. Uh, one second. Let me show again. I show in this case, but this is a typical situation. I'm sorry, I couldn't find it immediately. So the final dimensional representations of the algebra are all of them are here, all of them. And in fact, they're in the bottom of the representation. You see, these representations, all of them are infinite dimensional. Uh, but of course, and they're reducible. When you make them irreducible, you go to, to so to say to the bottom. And only in this case, the bottom is finite dimensional. So you contain, uh, the picture contains everything. Uh, all the infinite, not all, but the infinite dimensional and also the finite dimensional. It contains also the finite dimension. Okay, yes. thanks. Yeah, that's very important. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see that there are no more questions from the online audience so let me thank uh, vladimir once again we miss you in the portal we miss all the speakers who are remote but next time will be better and now yes, i hope next time be a coffee break real one here in corfu and a virtual one for the speakers and the audience and, and we it can be also real for us 